Everyone wants to be happy, but not everyone knows how to be happy or even what happiness is. Join us today as we discuss the nature and the pursuit of real happiness with our special guest, Father Robert Spitzer, S.J., founder of the Magis Institute and the author of the book, Finding True Happiness, Satisfying Our Restless Hearts. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Franciscan University presents. I'm Michael Hernan, a Vice President of Advancement here at Franciscan University and your host for the Franciscan University presents. I'm joined here in our studios by our regular panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization, again here at Franciscan University. And we're so pleased to welcome to Steubenville and to Franciscan University presents Father Robert Spitzer, a uh, Jesuit priest, uh, formerly the president of Gonzaga for uh, Gonzaga University for about 11 years. Uh, you are the founder of the Magis Institute, which I am a big fan of, which educates the public on the relationship relationship between physics, philosophy, reason, and faith. Uh, you are also the chief educating officer of the uh, Ethics and Performance Institute, the president of the Spitzer Center for Ethical Leadership. The list could go on. You've got uh, probably about 10 different books uh, that you've authored, um, but your latest is Finding True Happiness, Satisfying Our Restless Hearts. So, Father, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. It's so good to have you here in Steubenville and in and, and our program today. Um, the, the, the title of your book is, is really uh, great. Uh, but how do you define happiness? What does that mean? Is it, is it uh, uh, the same way that the secular world defines it? <laughs> in, in one half minute. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Well, you know, I might start off by uh, giving a, a little bit of a prescient phrase from Aristotle at the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics. And uh, he says there, I'm paraphrasing now, happiness is the one thing you can will in and for itself, choose in and for itself. Everything else is chosen for the mm. sake of happiness. Well, that just tells you where the stakes are. This one word for Aristotle is controlling what we think about success, what we think about the family we will have in the future, or the, the colleagues we will meet, the career we will pursue. But more than that, it's going to form the way we look at ideals or principles or values. It's also going to look at the way that we look at religion. It's going to look at the way we look at ourselves, whether we're going to consider ourselves a clump of atoms or molecules, whether we're going to consider ourselves a transcendent being that's pursuing something of, of high minded purpose and eternal dignity uh, with God. So, uh, you know, this one word, Aristotle said, if you can get a hold of this early on in the lives of young people, you're very likely to change their life and you're likely to give them freedom. Mm. And this is the idea, is to give them a freedom to pursue a destiny where they have a clear uh, uh, idea of what's called the telos, their end, their objective of their lives. And of course you might know that Aristotle was one of these teleological philosophers, he's always pointing toward an end or a, a final cause and, and he saw happiness. That was the end of all ends. Hmm. That was the telos not only of the ethical life but of life itself. So getting back to your question, you know, what about the definition uh, of happiness? And there, of course, are four major definitions of happiness, mm -hmm. which are quite different from one another, has sort of been elucidated throughout the centuries. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, one definition is, uh, you know, you probably discover it in Jeremy Bentham and some of those wonderful utilitarians. Happiness is like increasing my number of pleasure impulses per second. Right. So he's basically almost a hedonist, right? He's, he's a, a person who's very, very pleasure-based. Yes. And he identifies happiness 
with some kind of extrinsic physical stimulus that comes to me. Bob Spitzer sees the bowl of linguine, smells the extra <laughs> garlic, lunges right. toward it, right. yeah. and go, wolves it down. You're making us eating. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Please> stop. <laughs> but that, that's, that's right. So we call it level one happiness yeah. because it's the least pervasive, enduring, and deep, sure. uh, although it's very intense, that's immediately right. gratifying. I still like linguine. So. And I love linguine. And, and there's nothing wrong with linguini, the, the question ultimately gets down to what's going to be your dominant view of happiness. So people can still like linguini, you just don't want to define your life in terms of it, or your dominant view of happiness in terms of it. Then there's a second view of happiness, which is the one, of course, everyone's going to recognize in the American culture, right? I mean, this is uh, what we call ego comparative happiness. So this kind of happiness uh, comes when I get an ego boost, and the ego boost will come when I get a comparative advantage. So this kind of a person's constantly looking around who's you know, more intelligent, who's less intelligent, who's more successful, less successful, got more status, less status, who's winning, who's losing, you know, who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's got more power, less power, more control, less control. Mm -hmm. But it's all about more or less in a series of comparative aspects. So when you get to 80 years old, you can say, you know, I was smarter than all these other poor saps, and uh, I, I was more athletic, that wouldn't be me, than all <laughs> these other poor saps, you know, but for all intents and purposes, right, at the end of the day, all you can say is, I was better than people, but there's nothing else there. I mean, it is absolutely uh, vacuous, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, Latin, by the way, has a, four Latin names for each of these kinds of happiness, and you can sort of see them as you're going through Augustine's Confessions, mm. right? You know, that when he's really talking about that pleasure, happiness, the linguini, right? The, the pears, as it were. You know, he's talking about litus, you know, L A E T U S. And then uh, when you get up to the ego compared, and by the way, Augustine was an expert yeah. at ego comparative happiness. You know, nothing he liked better than mopping the floor with the debate competition and, <laughs> and winning because he was such a winner. And, uh, and uh, that's called, uh, you know, Felix, F-E-L-I-X, you know, so uh, Felix, uh, or the cat, if you, <laughs> it dates myself. <laughs> and then the third level of happiness uh, is called Beatitudo and, or, or uh, Beatus you know, and you'll recognize that, uh, beatitudo, the beatitudes, right? And that's the kind of happiness that comes from contributing to somebody else, mm -hmm. making a positive difference to somebody or something beyond myself. So ego comparative happiness is always pointing to me. You know, I'm the winner. I'm the smartest. I'm the whatever. But the e e when you talk about contributive happiness, right, or level three happiness, uh, beatitudo, you're really talking about investing yourself in somebody or something beyond yourself. Something you want to make a positive difference to family, to friends, to country, to God, to your church, to the kingdom of God, right, to, to your community, right, to your organization, your institution. You're looking for ways that you can make an optimal positive difference to the world before you leave. So nobody wants to get to 80 years old and go, you know, hey, what was the difference between the value of my life and that of a rock? And have to say, well, the rock probably <laughs> did more. I was a net negative, right? <laughs> right? So essentially, we begin to realize, you know, that ego comparative happiness is empty. And we feel emptiness, That's by the way, uh, when, when we have no contributor. If we feel like we do nothing for anyone, that our life makes no meaningful difference to the world around me you feel a terrible sense of alienation, emptiness within. But then there's a fourth kind of happiness. And, and that fourth kind of happiness, as you would suspect, uh, is transcendent happiness because we're built for it. I mean, God, you know, if, you, know, and, you know, really has built us, if you take a look at chapter two of this book, where I talk about transcendent happiness, you know, there's, there's an inward communication, as this uh, theologian a long time ago, Rudolf Otto, wrote a book called The Numinous Experience, kind of a universal, you know, um, kind of phenomenon that he went out and sort of measured in various uh, uh, cultures and, 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 and uh, religions throughout history, and said, you know, why, why you know, up to about 100 years ago, where about 95% of people around the world 
religious. And of course, he, you know, he finally gets down to this interior experience of what he calls a mysterium tremendum, or you know, this idea of you know um, a sense of of God within, which is both fascinating and inviting, yet mysterious and overpowering. You know, but it it uh, leads to uh, what uh, you know Mercia Eliade would call the sacred. But anyway, the idea is we're built for it, and not only that, but Saint Augustine, following Plato. He said, you know, we've got these five transcendental desires. We desire perfect truth, perfect love, perfect goodness or fairness, perfect beauty, and perfect home. <clears throat> and uh, where did we get that from? Right. And uh, of course, you have to get it from God, but that's a proof. Uh, could could I just do. maybe step sure, in right fire away. Uh, and suggest that you've <clears throat> left out a, a form of happiness, a, a kind of fifth wheel. And it's what I'm having an experience of right now. When the guest corners the market on the conversation, and I don't have to say anything. <laughs> I, I can leave early and have some of that linguine. <laughs> That's my happiness. Yeah. But Aristotle, yeah. I mean, it's not open-ended. It's not yeah. amorphous. Uh, there are oh. some predications. That yeah. What is the Greek word eudaimonia, yeah, yes. happiness? governed by reason. So mm -hmm. where does reason fit in? Yeah, mm -hmm. for, uh, of course, Aristotle, you know, want to say, you know, if you take a look at the first levels of happiness, um, right, you, you've got this idea of a tripartite soul, right? And level one is, you know, the, the most basic part of the soul, right? The, the senses. Level two might be called the irascible appetite, but basically it's got some of the higher emotions and the passions in there. And then finally, of course, you've, you've got the rational appetite. Yeah. And this, this idea of the rational appetite, it is going to seek its ultimate end. If reason is set free from obstacles, right? If it's not obsessed by the passions, if it's not obsessed by sensory, uh, you know, um, uh, happiness, etc. If it's uh, free to pursue it, it's going to look for not just some happiness, not just some good in life. And, and Aristotle would call happiness, you know, this kind of ultimate good that we're pursuing, this, this good in life, but uh, it's going to seek its ultimate good in life, and that yeah. is where reason will say, you know, I meant right. for yeah. perfect truth. I meant yeah. for perfect love, goodness, truth, and and And, 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 and this is the highest faculty, uh, yeah. nous, which nous, makes exactly. us most like, like the gods. Exactly. Mm -hmm. As a parent of six kids, I hear that uh, <laughs> list, and I realize, of course, that the, that the kids, when they were children, were very self-centered, and as adolescents, they became comparative and competitive, right. and when we watch them getting married, then they become, you know, searching for the goods of other people, yeah. and as I approach my 60s, I'm yeah. also yeah. kind of looking for that transcendent yeah. happiness, too. Absolutely. You know, I, I think our culture, though, represents the decline. It's almost moving in the opposite direction. If you go back four or five centuries, that's where they started with the transcendent, and now it's a kind of hedonism that yeah. uh, represents a, yeah. a, a downward trend. For well, the whole culture is organized, I think, around the insistent need to gratify immediately the right. basest possible yeah. appetite. Yeah, and, and in fact, the immediate gratifications are so quick and so incisive, right. not just through computers, but I hate to say it, through horrible things like drugs, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, which can be procured just about anywhere. Yeah. Um, kids are really experiencing a kind of a dwarfing right. of their natural reason. Yeah. <clears throat> what Aristotle would call that, the, you know, the flight of the reason, right. you know, the eros of the mind yeah. that would allow you, in a way, to to move uh, to the highest levels, to transcendent levels, yeah. you know, and and uh, and there is a dwarfing. I mean, it's like an immaturity of right. reason. Right. And yep. uh, it's, it's you know, people say, well, it's you know, it's a lack of generativity and intimacy. You know, it's much more than that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's, it's, well, it's yeah. not just that we've grown indifferent to God, but maybe even indifferent to linguini, yeah. because <laughs> it takes it takes too long to make it. <laughs> right. I don't have time for the pasta. I need some. Exactly. The microwave. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, but to, yeah. to actually insist upon deferring gratification has I practically see. become the definition of oppression. You yeah. know? Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. It's anti-American. And, and, yeah. and for, for many people, yeah. they would define that as, as, as unhappiness. That's but, right. Yeah. But, but how would you define it? Unhappy, because you now defined clearly uh, happiness on both the transcendent and some of the goods all along the way there with it, Linguini. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 
unhappiness can occur for, for two reasons. I mean, now Aristotle looks at unhappiness as you're not fulfilling one of those major um, desires. And, and see, he, he links all those things. He calls them, you know, desire, uh, you know, and, and, and happiness are linked together. So a first level desire, well, most people can fulfill that unless, of course, you're living in a terribly destitute uh, environment where, you know, and some people obviously do. You know, um, but if you're not, you can get linguini if you need it. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, ego comparative happiness. If you have some uh, gifts, you know, you can get it. And the problem is, if you have some gifts, you'll keep wanting it and wanting it because this culture right. is going to encourage you yes. in that direction and encourage you into what's called an ego comparative dominance, which I'll talk about in a moment because that's a big source of unhappiness. Mm. But Aristotle says, look, if you've got one and two, but you don't have three and four, that's where the emptiness sets in. Yeah, right. And by the way, you can have one, two, and three. You can be a super contributive guy. Yeah. You can be super contributive to your family, super contributive to your friends. And then you're l shaving in the morning and you're looking at yourself in the mirror and nothing is coming back. Yeah. Severe feeling of emptiness is hitting you, the contributive, loving, generative, good person. And you're looking at yourself and nothing, you feel this emptiness in the pit of your stomach. You're walking down the street, right? And, and all of a sudden you feel a sense of alienation, like you don't fit in here. You're not at home in the totality. I mean, let's just call it not at homeness <laughs> on a most profound and cosmic level. It's, you could be in the middle of your family and with all, surrounded by all your friends and feel that same emptiness, that same alienation, that not at homeness, you could feel a profound sense of loneliness because it's not loneliness for a person. Yeah. It is you want to be at home, you want to be unified with the, 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 the personal God, you know, the, the, the sense of, of cosmic loneliness. You're, you're absent this, you can't escape those feelings of emptiness and alienation and loneliness. And that is unhappiness. Yes. I mean, hold I, on to that. I, I'm going to hold that thought. Yeah. Stay with us for the next segment of Franciscan Newsroom Presents. There are two basic conceptions of happiness. One goes in the direction of taking, the other goes in the direction of giving. The taking direction would be a pleasure-based happiness. Now, nothing wrong with pleasure. I love pleasure as much as anybody. It's great. The problem with pleasure is if it becomes a dominant or even exclusive orientation of life. That spiritually kills. The other approach, the, the approach of giving, the, approach, the value responding approach, there to find out what is good, authentically good and beautiful and true. That's what's life giving. And when it's done to God, there, think of what God gives you. He gives you a home. He gives you a long life. He gives you friends. He gives you the inner divine family as well as your earthly family. That is authentic happiness. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking with uh, Father Robert Spitzer about his new book, Finding True Happiness, uh, Satisfying Our Restless Hearts. Um, Father, something that is very apparent in our world uh, is that people are searching for the wrong things. Uh, and, and you're talking about finding true happiness, but mm -hmm. comparisons uh, probably are, are, are plaguing us. Can you unpack that a little bit as we look at, at people's search for happiness and how the comparison or status envy or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. uh, interferes with that. Yeah, I think Father uh, Regis Martin already pointed out that, you know, we are very obsessed with uh, uh, level one happiness, which is immediate gratification, and it's not just linguini and lots of it, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, give me uh, as much uh, uh, immediate gratification as I can get. But really the, uh, the second problem is, um, and a much more important one in, in our culture is ego comparative happiness mm. uh, has become a dominant. Um, we figure, uh, you know, in the, in the Manjus Institute, we do a lot of measurement, 
And uh, we figure, you know, it's, it's around 70% of our young people mm. are already ego comparative dominant at the age of 16. Yeah. That is to say, they're, they're asking, you know, who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's got more power, less power, more status, less status, yes. more intelligent, less intelligent, et cetera. And they're, they're obsessed with it. Mm. <clears throat> and they're not only obsessed with it, but they're, uh, you know, they're really finding um, a great deal of difficulty dealing with the consequences of it. Because if you let that go to the max, <clears throat> if this is the only thing that's going to make you happy, if this is the only thing you know, that, that will make you successful or think, make you think you had a good life, then you can expect the following things, to, uh, emotional results to occur. Number one, you're going to feel jealousy. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel definitely fear of failure. Yes. Fear of loss of esteem. I mean, sweat and bullets at night. Some of these kids can't even take, you know, a, a, a an exam. You know, a standardized exam. They're so nervous that a, a kid with a 160 IQ is winding up with a lousy score because they think, you know, the, the SAT is is like definitional, yeah, self-definition. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, it's it's not just that. I mean, it's it's a variety of other things. I mean, you see in them, you know, ego rage and ego blame, you know, yeah. they, you know, just like out of control, self-pity over mm. the top. Mm. And even the winners, the winners can't find happiness because, of course, <clears throat> you cannot make a mistake in public. Yeah. You cannot essentially, uh, you know, uh, I remember once I, I pronounced the word in the, in the 12th grade, I was giving a, a talk in my physics class, I pronounced the word spectroscopy as spectroscopy. <laughs> and this kid comes up to me afterwards and goes, uh, Spencer, that word spectroscopy, you pronounced it spectroscopy three times, and now everybody believes you're a consummate idiot. And of course, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Most of our <laughs> listeners don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is, it's just a, a, a word for basically a, a test to find out what elements are present. Right, right, yeah. But the, the main thing, though, is that, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I went home, played that tape in my mind a hundred times. I couldn't go to sleep. I even had to start <laughs> to have suicidal feelings. I get you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, and, and because I just thought my life is over, you know. Wow. That's how much ego comparative happiness yes. can, can get to kids. And, and it's not just kids. It yes. can get to adults. I mean, oh, you can sure. be the top surgeon in your place, the top professor, you know, don't make a mistake, yes. you know, I mean, whatever you do, and whatever you do, don't plateau, yeah. because oh. your, your meaning in life will be over. So you've got this huge, <coughs> excuse me, range of emotions, you know, <coughs> excuse me, ego comparative emotions, jealousy, <coughs> fear of failure, uh, definitely fear of loss of esteem, ego sensitivities, ego rage, ego blame, self-pity, and inferiority, superiority, and a variety of other things. And you wonder why the suicide rate yeah, yeah, is so yeah. high among our young people. This is, it, they're being tormented. It, it, you know, That's just to be uh, uh, <clears throat> flippant for a moment, uh, I think the, uh, the suicide rate, if it weren't so high, would probably edge up the murder rate because people yeah. like that are impossible to live with. Uh, yeah. I mean, it awakens a kind of murderous rage against that kind of massive egomania. Mm -hmm. How did we get like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we got there from, uh, uh, I think, a lot of cultural encouragement from the regular media who has been presenting ego comparative happiness as if it could really be the full satisfaction of humanity. Yeah. You know, I used to take my college classes and, and have them do an assessment, you know, level one, level two, level three, level four, please watch the following TV programs or, you know, watch whatever your favorite programs are and then watch the ads between the programs and just tell me, you know, what do you come up with? Is this a dominant level one ad, a level two ad, a level three ad, a level four ad? Yeah. These kids would go home, of course, shockingly, right? <clears throat> the vast majority of ads are level two and, you know, appeal right there. And the programs are almost fit, you know, right. to, to correspond to yeah. the ads, not vice versa. Right. And, uh, <coughs> and do make these appeals, excuse me. Yeah. I think there are other contributing factors, mm -hmm. too, in our culture, many. Uh, I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, there's a paradox that the more egalitarian we get, the more we foster individualism, mm -hmm. the more people become rivalrous and comparative. It's not just jealousy where you want what somebody else has. I think it's what the Greeks called phthanos. 
yeah. NVIDIA. It's that deadly sin, one of the seven, but in some ways the deadliest of them all from mm -hmm. what we read in Wisdom 2.24. It was the envy of the devil that became the source of sin and death for the human race. And I honestly believe that envy, where you look at something that somebody else has, like Cain, who sees his younger brother's sacrifice accepted, and instead of asking if we could exchange so that I could offer an acceptable sacrifice, he sacrifices his own brother. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, you know, there was a famous book written years ago, Helmut Schuch, a professor at Johns Hopkins, yeah. wrote uh, Envy, A Theory of Social Behavior, and he said the only social force that is equal to envy is the fear of being envied. You know, so envy is that resentment of the advantages of others, but once you get the gold medal, then you begin to realize that you are the object of envy. Or once you get fame and fortune or wealth, and so Shock, as in this book, shows how the successful try to either hide their successes or kind of uh, wear their failures and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I just think that this describes politics, this describes mass media, mm -hmm. and even what happens to sports stars when they when they flourish, when they succeed, you know, they don't know how to handle it because they realize they are being resented by a lot of others. You know, the, the solution I think is pretty easy, uh, self-forgetfulness. And, and to the degree that we rivet our minds on God, the other, the transcendent, we become blessedly uh, less self-aware, less self-consumed self-absorbed, mm -hmm. because what you're describing is really crippling, paralyzing. Oh, yeah. uh, why would people want to be like this? They, they don't, they don't know any better. As you know, as the kids, you know, point out to me, uh, call it, these are undergrads, uh, point out to me, they, they basically say, look, you know, nobody's heard of level three or level four. <laughs> I said, well, you're, you're Catholics or didn't, right. didn't you grow up as a Catholic? Yeah, well, we, we did, but uh, you know, uh, um, you know, it, it just kind of receded to the back of our mind. It's something we do on Sundays. I said, well, you better start putting it out front on weekdays because, you know, it is blessedly yeah. uh, not only absorbing yourself in God and absorbing yourself in the good of the other is blessedly uh, non self right. Catholic kids yeah. don't know this. Right. It's like but, they, you know, it's they board really the cultural elevator and it, there are only two buttons, floor yeah. one and two. Right. <laughs> and they've got three, two other floors, but there's That's no right. button to get there. But this is yeah, very, this a is a complete disconnect of yeah. putting together their religious training with happiness and ethics. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Well, Father, this is really yeah. disheartening because uh, I, I would have thought that the longing for God was really the deepest, uh, most natural, even spontaneous drive of the human heart, this eros, this surge of the spirit uh, in search of the divine, the other, God. Well, it, it is in a way, but what Aristotle noticed was that on the lower levels of happiness, you have what's more intense, immediately gratifying, and surface apparent. Now that, you, you know, if you've got computer games with super graphics, or you've got, you know, designer drugs, or you've got, you know, clothes that are just, you know, dazzling, uh -huh. you know, or programs that are just enticing, yeah. right? And That's you've right. got all these things, and it appeals right there to immediate gratification, surface apparentness, and intensity. Unfortunately, there's a reverse, a reciprocal relationship to what is more pervasive. That is to say, it does more good outside myself. Right. What's enduring, what lasts longer, yeah. and what is deepest, what involves our highest intellectual powers, moral powers, spiritual power. Yeah. What, what attitudes or habits do you think <clears throat> in our culture today and our society uh, really lead, uh, lead us to this, this unhappiness? Well, I think... First of all, I shouldn't say this, but commercialism uh, in its raw form controls uh, a lot of the media. Yeah. And uh, what sells products, unfortunately, is one and two. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, self-image uh, is level two, you know, par excellence, right? I mean, look at the number of ads that, you know, are enhancing self-image be, you know, just a little more godlike, yeah. you know, yeah, a little yeah, more, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, heroic, <laughs> you know, than the average guy. And look at the number of products that are level one oriented, you know, and then the ones right in between the new Mercedes 500 E Class with the leather upholstery, <laughs> right? You know, so I mean, yeah. essentially, you know, what you've got there is is such a trajectory, and now it's in the social media 
all over the place. Look at Facebook. What matters is not who you are or what you believe in or the ideals you aspire to or the transcendent religion you adhere to that gives you your dignity. That's all off the table. Yeah. It's pick selfies of me, you know, and, and the image I can craft, but it's only images that can be captured in pictures, pithy little, you know, uh, uh, sayings that go along with the picture. It's aimed at level one and two. Yes. As uh, you know, Scott was just saying, there's only two buttons on the elevator, right. and the kid is literally yeah. exposed day and night to this until they are taken up in it. And you, you know, when you get to college, it's still not uh, too late no. because you can start telling kids about the comparison game. They know jealousy, fear of failure, fear of loss of esteem, ego sensitivities. They know it all. <clears throat> and all you have to do is appeal to that and say, hey, do you want a ticket out of your own self-created hell? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. give it to you. It's, it's going to be contributive and transcendent happiness. And in the end, contributive happiness will never be enough because you have these, ulti- these desires for ultimate, perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. And even God is within you calling you to himself. Mm. In, for the, Thou hast made us for thyself, said Augustine, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Well, the point, of course, is you got to give them the full menu. Yeah. And the culture is out there to make sure we do not do that. Yeah. They do not want these kids to hear about three and four. Yeah. It'll distract them no end from one and two, which sells products, and moreover, uh, you know, as, as Aristotle said a long time ago, keep somebody on level one and two, you can lead them around by the no. Yes, right. yes. and you make a lot of money in the process. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and exactly. you think about even even good good people who go on whether it be Facebook or other social media, who yeah. end up having these uh, these uh, wars, if you will. They're, oh, is my kids better than your kids, or my pictures, or my quotes, or whatever? You know, there's this oh, yeah. this this comparison that's an ego comparison. Yeah, I think the culture has to rise up and say. We're not playing the game anymore. That's right. We're That's going right. to go for something a little bit more profound, pervasive, enduring, and deep. But but to make you know, that I mean, critique, uh, yeah. you have to step outside the culture. Yes, you do. That has so carefully coached and programmed everyone. Uh, yeah. They're inside this uh, this penal colony, <laughs> and how do they step outside yeah. to experience what they don't have? Yeah, it's the perfect image, like that fellow who's caught inside the television set and finally discovers it, you know, at, at the end. I forget what the name of the movie was, but it's anyway. outside the, yeah, 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 the Truman Show. The Truman something. Show. Yeah. That's right. right. Yeah. And, Stay uh, with us for the next segment of uh, Franciscan Presents. In today's society, we can get the impression that to be a person of value, you have to own things. Um, Or there's a societal message that if you have nothing, you are nothing. So underlying this consumeristic value is the idea that true happiness is related to possessions or to material goods. Um, So we have this idea perhaps that if we have a larger house or if we have a more luxurious car or if we have a larger shoe closet, we're gonna be happier people. Um, But interestingly, research actually suggests that people who are wealthy aren't any happier than those who have the means to take care of their basic needs, but who aren't excessively um, wealthy. So true happiness isn't really about what we have or what we own, but instead it's about fostering healthy relationships, it's about um, developing our potentials, it's about giving back to the community, and it's about finding meaning in our lives. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about the pursuit uh, of, of true happiness with Father Robert Spitzer. Um, Father, so we, we've kind of defined happiness. We've gone into some of the challenges of our day and our, our age, but let's talk about Christians and happiness. Um, you know, what do we as, as people of faith, people who believe in God, what do we bring uniquely uh, to this, uh, this question of happiness? I think I kind of sense where you may go with this. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, of course, I think uh, Christianity has 
the greatest articulation of level four. And, and the reason that it does is because Jesus himself had the greatest articulation of level four. Mm -hmm. And uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, when you really look at, you know, the faith life that he was calling us to yes. and redirecting us to and the salvation that he was redirecting us to and the resurrection that he was directing us to. But it wasn't just the future resurrection. Jesus is talking about bringing the kingdom right down here. And of course, when you're doing that, you're t talking about making God alive and well in your hearts. And how does that happen? Through the Holy Spirit. Yes. I mean, uh, I, and of course, uh, I mean, here we are, four of us who are majorly influenced by the Holy Spirit yes. in our lives. I mean, if I were to go around and ask this group, you know, well, do you um, not only believe in the Holy Spirit, but do you sense the Holy Spirit leading you every day, inspiring you, guiding you? Everybody here is going to say, yeah, because of course we feel that, you know, almost internal uh, sense, that drive, that openness, that new possibility, that urgency, that fascination that's drawing us into one opportunity after the next. And of course, the Holy Spirit is not just working in me, He's working in all of us, and He's working in a grand conspiracy of divine providence, yes. which is far beyond us. So, I mean, if we open ourselves to the opportunity and, and we got this sense of where He's leading us to, and we feel that sense of just go right on in to this new door that's being opened and inviting us. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we're going to say the Holy Spirit is the most evident thing uh, around, and it's the Spirit of Jesus Christ because mm -hmm. He operates through everything that Jesus said and did. And of course, the, the apostles, and, and even to this day, you know, healing occurs uh, through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. I mean, all of these things were done in, in Jesus' name because it is, uh, you know, the Spirit of Jesus. And so, you know, the Christians come on the scene and we've got the Holy Spirit and the church. Yeah. We have the teachings of Jesus that just tell us what level four is, yeah. how to pursue it. But I have found um, because of the, the setup that the kids are in in the culture, and they, they are set up to the elevator with two floors. I mean, as we have to introduce it slowly. You can't just get out and talk about the Holy Spirit. You can't, you know, just, you know, give Jesus quotes. You can to a certain group who have been well-formed by their parents. But if they haven't been well-formed by their parents and they're very lukewarm, you have to sort of lead them up to it. So I've been finding that, okay, in order to get them to the truth, I'll take them through the contributive happiness. But I, I do know that when I talk about uh, what I call cosmic emptiness, alienation, and loneliness, that is to say, on that totalistic level, when they're with their families and they still feel lonely, when they're walking down the street and they feel out of kilter with the totality, not at home here, when they're looking in the mirror and shaving and feeling the profound emptiness within, I say, what do you guys think about this? I mean, has this ever happened? Oh, yeah, yeah, has it happened to us? I said, what do you think is going on there? Do you think you're missing something? What's, what do you think is going on there? And they go, is, is it like God? I, I, I think you might be onto something there. <laughs> and of course, then once you've got them kind of interested that level three is not enough, I give them some uh, real easy evidence. Uh, I, I give them, you know, uh, near-death experiences, uh, peer-reviewed medical studies. You bring them? them? Oh, okay. I bring them in. Uh, because anecdotal ones are, you know, bad, but the peer-reviewed medical studies are, uh, you know, these kids look at it and go, oh my gosh, maybe there is a soul. Maybe I'm not a clump of atoms and molecules. Remember, they've just been thoroughly indoctrinated by culture, right? Your atoms, your molecules. And for the first time, when they begin to see, what do you mean 80% of blind people see for the first time when they're clinically dead with flat EEG, no uh, gag reflex, fixed and dilated pupils, no electrical activity, even in the lower brain, let alone the, you know, the cerebral cortex? You know, what, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean that by that is that's what they're doing. They're seeing and they report vertical data. First time in their life they can see colors and shapes and actually report and prove to you that they did. I said, what do you think? 
you, you can't explain this with the typical physicalist views, right? Because, of course, how could you have a hallucination about something you never had a visual image of yeah. before that you could memorize and then hallucinate about? Yeah. There's nothing in the brain to hallucinate. Anoxia can't explain it. Morphine can't explain it. There is no visual image there. And so, of course, you, you be, can begin to see these kids start waking up, right? And then, of course, I give them the latest evidence for the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> because you know one of my little uh, you know uh, expertises you know and uh, in another book God so loved the world I have a, a full you know explanation of it in the website modicenter.com I have a full explanation of the science science in the shroud of Turin it's in, in, incredible it is. Uh, the relic of the resurrection on there I mean that image has to be per, uh, produced it, it's only on the very outermost surface of the fibrils, never penetrates to the medulla, gives rise to a perfect three-dimensional photographic uh, image, right, negative image. And it, the only way it can be produced is uh, in a laboratory with uh, what's called an eczema or ARF laser uh, producing uh, uh, several billion watts of light energy for one forty billionth of a second. You tell me how a dead body can produce from every three-dimensional point, interiorly and exteriorly, can produce several billion watts of electrical, uh, you know, um, uh, light, uh, uh, vacuum ultraviolet radiation for one forty billionth of a second. I'm telling you, these kids, they, they go, okay, so okay, so maybe there's some evidence. There's some God reasonableness to our. There's faith. some reasonableness. <laughs> Uh, so what do you want to say with this? And then you can start zooming in on it. Now, some kids will want some proofs from God. Some kids will want some proofs from science. And you can, there's plenty of that. But the main thing is once you can see, once you have taken back the credibility, and believe me, these kids have been set up yeah. so that they believe there is no evidence for the transcendent, no evidence for God, no evidence for a soul, and no evidence for Jesus. They don't even think there's evidence that Jesus walked and talked on the earth. Now, of course, no, Scott can blow that out of the water in two seconds. But the main thing, though, is we got to get it to them. Yeah. And okay. then we, we win back the credibility. And, and, we and just then we can, can speak to them about yeah. happiness. And then we can draw yeah. them into that because they need exactly. to realize that they are transcendent yeah. beings. And they're you know, what, what, what I find uh, is a particularly resonant argument is yeah. the one that, that is drawn out of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think the man who suffers is really the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, dialogue partner uh, for Christianity today. And, and if you can somehow demonstrate that here is a God who entered into your brokenness uh, mm -hmm. and who feels it more keenly, mm -hmm. more deeply than you, and, and what's more can redeem it. Uh, your misery has a kind of meaning now. But that mm -hmm. lifts the heart. That gives them, I think, a reason to go on, that my, my suffering can be assuaged by His presence. Oh, yeah. And the very examples that you cite, I think, lead people to that because, you know, avoidance of pain is sort of like, the necessary prescription for levels one and two. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and yet, if you can show them that there is a soul, that there is a God, that there was a resurrection, that there is no scientific explanation except to accept that, you know, mm -hmm. I think then suddenly you can realize that the transcendent always involves the dark night. It always involves the cross, mm -hmm. not just for Jesus, but for each and every one of us. And so, you know, get off the treadmill of running from mm -hmm. suffering because you're not going anywhere, but as soon as you get off, you're going to suffer, you know. Oh, yeah. And to be able to explicate the deeper logic of that, you know, in terms of what you called the grand conspiracy of divine providence. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you realize I'm not the source of my happiness. Mm -hmm. He is, and I can trust him more than I can trust myself. You know, mm -hmm. I was also struck by how those four levels, in some ways, mm -hmm. roughly correspond to the four causes, the material, yeah. the efficient, <laughs> the formal, and the final, yeah. and how science's mission, at least yeah. scientism, is to eradicate all finality and formality. Yeah, exactly. That formal causes and final causes yeah. are a kind of vestige of the Aristotelian Middle Ages, you know, and all of that. But Which in fact, in quantum theory are coming back rapidly. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> right. They, they always come back to yeah. bite you and you yeah, know, yeah, push yeah. them down. Yeah. But to me, you know, all of this sets us up to recognize mm -hmm. that the uh, the crown of glory that we all strive for can only come through the cross. Mm -hmm. And it isn't as though we have to invent the cross. It's, you know, on the one hand, Jesus bore it, but then he also bestows one. And mm -hmm. 
suddenly you find out this is a deeper happiness than anything that the world or even reason alone could reveal. Yeah. Grasp. Yeah. On our, our website, you know, mindjustcenter.com, we, we, uh, we, we actually have a whole page, uh, we have four landing pages. One of them is the faith in science and the faith in reason, you know, proofs of God, you know, Shroud of Turin, set, et cetera. But one of them is simply on happiness and suffering. And the suffering yep. is the, the other side of the component. And again, the kids have been cult culturally indoctrinated to believe that suffering and love are dichotomous. Right. So they, they yeah. do believe that somehow if you're suffering, no love can come out of that and no loving God could allow that. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is dispel that immediately. And if you can dispel it very, very quickly, which you can, and I'll just describe in a moment, then they can begin to embrace the cross. So we, we just talk about very pragmatic goods that come from suffering. I mean, yeah. people who know me know that uh, I've been going blind for the last six, seven years here at a pretty rapid rate, you know, and they go, oh my gosh, you must just be, uh, you know, suffering terribly uh, uh, from this. And I say, well, it's a challenge, that's for sure, you know, and they, they give me the scenario that no good's coming out of it. So, of course, I always yeah. start with Paul's great uh, thought, you know, in Second Corinthians, you know, given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. Not just elated, proud. <laughs> I mean, in that sense of, yep. you know, there's far worse things in the world than suffering, you know, and, yes. and, and, the, and what is worse is pride yeah. because it's such a deep interior darkness, right. such a deep emptiness and loneliness and alienation from God. You know, and of course, Paul knows it. I mean, I'll, I'll take the suffer, I'll take the thorn in the flesh. I always thought it was an eye problem myself. <laughs> <laughs> Others do too. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. But you know, a, 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 a really a terrible thing that can overtake people yeah. is not just I don't suffer anymore, but I don't have any sympathy for those who do. The yeah. capacity for compassion, yeah. once that is gone, uh, yeah. then you might as well be in hell. You don't give a damn. You don't care about the other. His pain doesn't touch you. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the hell of, an, of a sociopath, literally, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the lack of empathy. Right. And, uh, but I do think we, we do have to take a little time out to explain to the kids. It's not just humility. But, I mean, what can suffering lead us to? It can shock us out of superficiality. Right. It certainly yeah. happened to me, you know, when I first, you know, wake went to college. Call. Wake up call, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, power, yeah. that sounds good. You know, <laughs> prestige sounds really good. You know, I had to get shocked out of it. Yes. And, of course, suffering can have such a great value. I mean, in my own life right now, I need lots of doses to kind of reawaken me to, you know, my real transcendent end and to, to, you know, connecting with God more and more and depending on Him every day. Yeah. But more than that, you know, the, there's, there's not just the practical things like humility or compassion or empathy that get developed through suffering. And, of course, shocking yourself out of superficiality, much more profound meanings in life. But your faith deepens. My expression is, you know, put a hole in my heart and the Holy Spirit can drive a Mack truck full of grace right through it. Amen. You know, and, and uh, it's really the truth because my need for God, my dependence on God, but above all, my openness to God just, you know, is suddenly increased dramatically in ways it never was before. And that's the good side, you know, but then there's the Therese of Lisieux side of suffering, which Jesus taught every one of us. Use this as an apostolate. Offer it up. You know, Paul's uh, letter to the Colossians, right? Just offer it up you know, to, to the Lord and just say, look, Lord, I'm going to take this suffering. I'm going to make it a self-sacrifice. Just, I'm going to join it to Jesus' self-sacrifice. And I'm going to uh, uh, give it over to you as an act of love. All right. You take that love and bestow it on all the people who need it. Amen. 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 And, uh, Stay with us for the final segment of uh, that Presents. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both.
Welcome to the final segment of today's program on Franciscan University Presents. Uh, Regis, could you start us off? No, no, I'd be, uh, I'd be delighted to. Uh, Father, what a joy it has been having you here. And, and not just because of self-serving reasons. <laughs> you, you obviate my having to say anything at all. But <laughs> everything that you say is so rich uh, and profound uh, uh, and incisive that we're no end of grateful uh, for your wisdom. What, what an irony that God should strike you blind and yet give you sight, like Tiresias, that classical figure mm -hmm. whom Eliot says uh, saw the poem, the wasteland, uh, and what he sees is what we read. And uh, what you are saying is, is so profound, uh, so life-giving. Uh, maybe uh, I could simplify things. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how could you be any more productive than you are already. Maybe if God had drawn you to the Dominicans, uh, then <laughs> imagine how prolific you'd have been. But Daniel Liu, uh, another Jesuit, okay. uh, uh, in Prayer as a Political Problem, he identifies three levels, which have always struck me as very persuasive. The material level, mastery of the world, uh, the physical universe, and we achieve this through work. We subdue the environment, and that's very satisfying but it doesn't exhaust the possibilities of being human. There is that second level, communion with others in friendship and love. Mm -hmm. And yet even that doesn't fulfill us. There is that final dimension, uh, which is prayer, adoration. And if that is left out of uh, one's calculus, then one is empty uh, and uh, uh, hellishly incomplete. And, and that's the question I have. Why don't people feel that emptiness uh, more keenly than they do? I mean, C.S. Lewis says, if, if there are experiences you have of thirst and hunger and longing, and there's nothing in this world that can satisfy them, then maybe you were made for another world. Exactly. But that doesn't seem to have crossed people's minds, mm. despite all of your apologetics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Regis. Mm -hmm. Scott? Another better known figure, Saul of Tarsus, you know, <laughs> losing his natural vision in order to be given the grace of a supernatural vision of the risen Lord. You know, it seems to me that you've coordinated, you know, not only faith and reason, not just philosophy and theology, but science and history and literature in a way that is, uh, you've set the table for people in this culture to discover more than the hors d'oeuvres <laughs> and to be invited to a banquet and at the same time to hear the truth hit them wherever they are, level one, level two, nothing more. But the fact is, I think we all have this fear of suffering. And in a sense, that explains why people are not just motivated, but driven to stay at level one or two because they just don't see any purpose to suffering. I think in some ways the greatest healing that Jesus does is not just to give sight to the blind or raise the dead, but to heal us of the crippling and paralyzing fear of suffering by showing us that suffering really is that means by which we reach an end that goes beyond what we thought exhausted our desires. And at the same time, it opens up a level of fulfillment and happiness that taps into levels one, two, as well as three and four, and then takes us to the Trinity. And so your work, I think, is an indispensable cultural bridge. It's, it's almost like the big dig in Boston where you've got tunnels <laughs> going in all kinds of directions, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so thank you for that. But and not I, as costly. Yeah, not <laughs> nearly, yes. Uh, Father? Thanks. Well, you know, just responding to, to both, you know, I, I do think these fears are, are uh, uh, very legitimate, and as we've been saying throughout, I think uh, kids have been culturally indoctrinated to, to have them, and it's very hard to give up a fear, uh, just as it's very hard to give up a passion uh, that we've kind of grown used to. Right. Um, and uh, I do think, though, that what's called for is not just education so that, you know, uh, people are going to know the, um, you know, the, uh, the options, level three and level four, but there has to be a call to action. Uh, knowing it is not enough. And, um, you know, uh, when kids say, you know, okay, maybe there is a God, maybe there is a soul, maybe these near-death experiences say something, maybe the shroud saying something, maybe there's New Te Testament, you know, historical stuff is, is important, but you have to do what I call fiat. There's a point at which you just that we've got enough knowledge now, there's yeah. enough evidence, we know what we have to head for, our transcendent good. 
I need to put together a strategy for getting to that transcendent good. And that means putting together a prayer life, putting together, right, start with spontaneous prayers. Don't have to, you know, be profound. You don't have to write the prayers of, you know, St. Teresa of Avila. What you need to do is just, how about help? How about, right, you know, uh, <laughs> Lord, make good come out of, you know, this terrible suffering. Or how about, you know, Lord, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Or I give up, you take care of it. And in the book there, there's all kinds of, you know, little spontaneous prayers uh, you can rely on or just on the website, mongecenter.com, you can just go to. And, uh, and just start there, but you've got to start praying. Yes. And the second thing I think we need to do desperately is get our kids to commit to start with 10 minutes of prayer per day. You know, just, and, and there's some easy ways to do it uh, that are suggested in there and, and so forth, you know, to, to, to commit to that so that they're in communion with God. You know, I mean, just a decade, a meaningful decade of the rosary. Just start there, but just do it every day. Just commit yourself to it. And again, you know, uh, putting together your little strategy for, for prayer, I would just say, please look at those rules for following the Holy Spirit in your life. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Spirit's there, the Holy Spirit is leading all of us, you know, not just the people in this room, every single one of us, if we just get used to hearing how he's working, he's never going to, you know, uh, alleviate a suffering that could cause us good or cause somebody else good for their salvation. He's never going to alleviate suffering that's going to underestimate uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, freedom. is not going to, uh, you know, undergird our human freedom or uh, undermine our human freedom. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if we learn, you know, what he's up to, he's always leading us to our salvation, always leading us to help others to their salvation, always leading us to an optimally meaningful and significant life oh, in that salvation, and uh, optimally leading us uh, to Jesus Christ. So I, I would just say getting that strategy together to take action on prayer in our spiritual life, and of course the Eucharist is the key means. Mm -hmm. if, the, if anybody here could get to Mass an extra time per week, just to do it, right? And I know here it's very commonplace at Steubenville, but just uh, for the audience, oh, it's just essential good. to start it. Yeah, thank you, Father. If you've enjoyed today's program, we have a handout just for asking, uh, Finding True Happiness, Escaping Your Personal Hell from Father Spitzer. Also, talks from him at faithandreason.com. I want to invite you to be a part of our mission here at Franciscan University uh, to educate, evangelize, and send forth joyful disciples. Consider coming to campus and getting a degree, immersing yourself in the truth and love of Jesus Christ, coming to our, our summer conferences, traveling with us to holy sites through our pilgrimage office. Be equipped and inspired through Faith and Reason website, faithandreason.com. Um, Father Spitzer, could you close us with a blessing? Absolutely. And may the Lord bless and keep you all and send His Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire you and to guide you, that you might know the true happiness to which the Lord is calling you and has called you from the day of your conception, that you might know how to follow that Spirit and diligently pursue Him not only in your own lives, but in the lives of the people you touch. May the Lord inflame you with his love and teach you to preach it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.